Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. I picked out a message that I preached some time ago. It's probably years ago. Because uh, this has really been on my heart. Someone has said, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's credited with that, but I don't think anybody's ever found that in his writings. Somebody said it. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Paul says here in chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, that the price of truth is eternal vigilance. And Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Now, the reality of what happens when we don't do that is all around us and all through history. In a very practical way, I grew up with probably 20 teenage boys, my age, give or take a couple years. To my knowledge, almost none of them are living the gospel. Now, they may be members of churches, but the churches where they don't practice the things that we believe, uh, such as non-swearing of oaths, divorce and remarriage prohibited, uh, certainly militarism out of the picture. Uh, to my knowledge, the only person who is actually following that kind of obedience to Jesus would be Gail and Evie, uh, my good friend, as I was growing up. Some years ago, my mother asked me to transcribe from the many tapes I had of the messages that were preached at Chambersburg, uh, some of the sermons onto cassette so she could listen to them. And I was typesetting at the time so I could listen to them while I was transcribing them from reel to reel to cassettes. And Aaron Shank had meetings in our church several times, but uh, on one occasion, <clears throat> he decided each evening to read the names of the people who had responded the night before. And that was really interesting to me because here we were 30 years later and I could listen to those names and I could contemplate what had happened. Almost all of them, as I recall, had made shipwreck in one way or the other. So what Paul is saying here is very real. A few more examples. Howard Hammer, who was the first Mennonite mass evangelist who basically was the inspiration for George R. Brunk and Myron Augsburger later, ended by shooting himself in the head after he had killed his young Spanish mistress. That's how his life ended. After years of calling people to trust Jesus and obey, I guess. I never heard his message. In fact, that was such a devastating experience. I heard Myron Augsburger say that really rocked his faith, that somebody could preach that kind of message and then do that at the end. That just shows you how vigilant we need to be. The devil gets his oar in in very small ways. The, the, Howard Hammer did not take that as a leap. That came by steps, little compromises, and I don't know what they were, but I, I guarantee you that's how it happened. Or let's talk about corporate apostasy. The early church held to non-resistance without compromise for almost 200 years. At least... It's A.D. 74 before we have a record of a, of a soldier joining the church, a fighting soldier joining the church. And then that compromise grew throughout the next century and a half. And then we have in 313, we have Constantine professing to be a Christian. Now, he's an emperor with an army, and he baptizes his army into the church. Now, that was, there was a thin edge of the wedge that started there, and people like Tertullian really weighed in against this. He saw what was happening, uh, but it happened anyway. So, <clears throat> and then a, a horrible example of a Christian who was living in compromise is the man who wrote that wonderful song, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. The story is he was sitting on a ship and he was looking at a, a church or cathedral that had been destroyed and all that was left was one wall with a cross and he looked at that, and in the cross of Christ I glory, and towering o'er the wrecks of time. The truth is, he was sitting on his slave ship with hundreds of slaves below the deck in misery. And he was the man responsible. And he called himself a Christian. That looks bizarre. But there again, that didn't just happen. <laughs> 
there's, there, was a pro, there was a process that resulted in that kind of absurdity. Or we could take the Waldensians, those courageous people who began in the 11th century, the 12th century, and they were faithful for almost three and a half centuries. Just gave a beautiful testimony of the true gospel. They were known to have memorized huge portions of scripture. It was, you must remember, it was the days before printing press. And if you wanted to have the scripture at your fingertips, little portions of it were passed around, handwritten copies. Seldom did you ever get your hand on a complete copy. So you memorized it. I remember reading of a Waldensian who met somebody at a crossroads, and that man told later that that man stood there and quoted to him the entire book of Job. Can you imagine? And here were these courageous people who stood against the Roman Catholic Church for almost four centuries. And they finally were met by Guillaume Farrell, which was Calvin's sidekick, and they uh, gave in and became reformed. We visited Torre Police in northern Italy here the other year and uh, heard one of their own people give the history. And at the end, I said to him, I said, well, wasn't there a small protest? And I, he said, yes, there was. And I said, well, what happened to those people? He said, well, I think they joined the old Hussite church, the old John, John Huss uh, Unitus Fratrum, the, the old original uh, uh, Moravian congregation. Uh, and I checked with Peter Hoover, and of course, Peter Hoover knows such things, and he said that was true. So anyway, but it was just a very small minority. They protested, but that whole thing, after four centuries of the most beautiful testimony amidst the most horrible persecution, just like that. Now, Paul reminds us here that the Christian life is not a sprint. I've, in my lifetime, seen people get saved and jump up and down and praise the Lord and pass out tapes and are all excited for about five years. And you meet them 10 years later, and they've left the plain people. They're in some Protestant church somewhere, and you know everything's cooled down, and it's just, it's all over. The Christian life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. We've got to, we've got to run the whole way to the end. It's not a brief skirmish with the devil. It is constant hand-to-hand combat day after day after day, or he gets the thin edge in. And that's what Paul is saying. So I would like to read Second Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 24. Finally, now <laughs> I want to stop right there because I think the Apostle Paul may have realized he could have ended the book before this passage. Uh, he has talked in this book about the tremendous resources Christ has given us. Talk about encouragement. Read the book of Ephesians up to this passage. Uh, <clears throat> and this is an encouraging passage too, by the way, till it all ends. But there might be a few discouraging moments uh, in, the, in the course of the message. Let, let's talk a little bit about some of the themes he has. In, in, in chapter 1, he says God has actually adopted us into his family. He has made us sons of the creator of the whole universe. Can you imagine? And Peter says he gave us the divine nature. He redeems us by his blood. He takes all the sins off the record that we have committed. I, I, the older I get, the more I contemplate this. People call and ask me all the time, why is Christianity the only true religion? And I say, well, it's, it's the only religion, it's the only belief system, a truth system, where somebody came and did something that could take our sins off the record. All the other religions of the world talk about doing enough good things that you hope, you're never sure, that at the end, your good balances out the bad. I don't know of any other belief system or truth system, I'm going to call it truth system, actual reality, where you can actually have your sins removed from the record as if they never happened. Now, the consequences are still there, but as far as God is concerned, those sins are off the record. That's tremendous. And then it says he abounds toward us in all wisdom. <laughs> Abound means no limits. And prudence, which means the ability to carry out that wisdom. And then he seals us with the Holy Spirit. He gives us a supernatural drive and motivation and passion 
to, to move us supernaturally in a certain direction. He gives us that. He places all of heaven's resources. You've seen my little diagram I usually put on the board. I'm not going to put it there. All the resources of heaven, he opens those all up to us through Christ. He talks about the exceeding power that raised Christ from the dead given to us. And he talks about a church, a body of people who are filled with all the fullness of God. <laughs> I don't know about you, but this is a tremendous book. And in fact, I love to teach that first chapter. If somebody asks me to preach and don't tell me what to preach, and I've never preached it there before, that's what they're going to get. They're going to get Ephesians 1 with all that wonderful th stuff that I just said to you. In fact, St. Patrick was so overwhelmed with it, he wrote a little poem. And this is what he said. I arise today through the strength of heaven. Think about that. I arise today through the strength of heaven. Light of the sun. And then he gives, he gives some pictures of what, of what uh, symbols of, of, of what that is. Light of the sun. Splendor of fire. Speed of lightning. Swiftness of the wind. Depths of the sea. Stability of the earth. Firmness of the rock. Those are all symbols of the creator and his universe. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me. God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak to me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me afar and near, alone or in a multitude. Uh, <clears throat> I know you're, you're not getting time to absorb this like I do when I sit and just look at every phrase of this. Christ shield me today against wounding. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, when I lie down, when I sit down, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the eye that sees me, Christ in the ear that heals me, hears me. I arise today through the might and strength of the Lord of creation. And Paul says that we can comprehend with all saints what is the depth and the length and the height and the breadth of the love of God. And then in, before this, he's talking about all the relationships reconciled through Christ, whether it's Jew or Gentile, whether it's parents or children, whether it's employers or, employee or masters and slaves, that God knows how to bring everything together. So that's, that's the positive, that's the encouragement, Brother Marvin, that we have up to this, this point in, in the uh, book. And Paul could very well have ended his epistle right there. It's all true. But as Paul wrote, he realized he was chained to a Roman soldier. And that was a reminder that life was a battleground and not a playground. It was a reminder to, reminder to him of the similarity between that soldier with his armor and the spiritual armor that a Christian should have. And so finally is his important last word. Finally, there will be warfare on a grand scale. Only those who fight with courageous and vigilant persistence will win. And Paul himself is an example of that. He was dogged with constant conflict. I am more than these people who are criticizing me. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered a shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, journeyings oft, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings off, in hunger and thirst, in fastings off, and in cold and nakedness, besides these things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. And Paul said that the enemies that he had weren't just what he just described. He said, I have enemies within. I therefore so run, not as uncertain, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means... When I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So here's Paul picturing this tremendous battle with outside opposition and inside temptation. This is a battle. And we have three basic enemies. 
we're told that we have the enemy, the world. Well, what is the world? The world is systematized impiety, systematized materialism, systematized violence, systematized dishonesty, and systematized impurity. I say systematized because these are systems. These are, these are uh, not just in isolated things. They're a whole universe of themselves, the impurity. Just think of the whole universe of impurity that we struggle with. It's not just one little observation. It's a whole universe that involves the eye, the ear, everything. That's the world, okay? The flesh is inordinate, inordinate desires to gratify self. That's what the flesh is, inordinate. I mean, we all have desires that have legitimate satisfaction, but these are inordinate desires that have gotten out of bounds of selfishness, just wanting to please self. I read the other day, are you aware of the fact, and, and this is not a criticism, this is just a, an interesting fact, most of the people in our world do not sleep in beds. Did you know that? They don't have room in their house for beds. Most people live in a, a, a quarters that are small enough that they have to roll up their cots that they sleep on and put them under the table and put them under the benches and put them wherever. And then at night they unroll those and that's what they sleep on. There's no room in their houses for a bed for everybody. That's a luxury. It's a tremendous luxury just to have a bed to sleep in, Brother Harvey. I wish I knew what percentage of the world does not sleep in beds. And that's just beds. We could talk about a lot of things. And if we're not careful, a desire to sleep in a nice warm bed <laughs> gets out of hand and, and we start thinking of all kinds of selfish things that we have to have for ourselves. And I was just telling my wife, she was talking about various uh, things this morning that people do, and I said, you know what? When I was growing up, people didn't have time and they didn't have room and they didn't have the money to do most of the things that we're talking about right here. We lived in houses that had linoleum floors. We had all kinds of things that today we would consider inconveniences. And so that's the flesh. The flesh, if we're not careful, it, 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 it just simply keeps on and on and on and on and on. And this is not good enough, it's gotta be this. We have better taste, better comfort, better, 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 bigger, yeah. That's the flesh. And the devil is the liar who uses both the world and the flesh to destroy Christians by making them complacent and indulgent. Now, the key is to be strong in the Lord. Now, the Lord is pictured as our commander, and the key here is to obey the commander explicitly. He has given explicit rules. He says, for instance, do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth. And we can say, yes, he said that, but, and then we can rationalize. I'm just giving that as an example. If we're going to win in this battle, one of the things we will have to conquer is the tendency to get bigger and more and more security, more stuff, more, 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 more. That's, Jesus said, no. And I see many people, I could give you some examples of people who went down that road, and yeah, they succeeded, but then you see the picture on the wall of the restaurant of the family. Oh, oh, what happened? And the sad part is, at that point, they don't even connect the two. They see no connection between that picture on the wall and what you see all around you. They see no, no connection there. I'm just being honest here. Our captain is wiser and stronger than our enemy. His commands summarize, as Brother Elam was pointing out, an eternal perspective that, he, that we can live within if we take him seriously in everything that he said. He has the power to give life. The devil can only kill. The devil cannot give life. He does not have that power. And our victory is certain. The serpent's head has already been mortally wounded. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, Jesus said. He also said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He is a defeated foe. If we fight manfully. Christ has already broken Satan's power. And he promises to lead us all to victory. But we must obey his orders. 
The commander in an army is the person who sees the strategy. He sees the total picture. The soldier who's fighting often doesn't see very much. But if he listens to that commander, he can put what he's doing in total perspective of the battle. All right? And so he says in verse 11, put on the whole armor. There are many parts of, of our life we have to protect all at once. He pictures it with the head, the heart, the feet, and the devil knows which of those parts is the weakest. And that differs with each of us. I mean, there's some things that I see other people struggle with, it's just no big deal to me, but then I could tell them what I struggle with, it would be no big deal to them. And the devil knows what those are. He knows your weakest spot, he knows my weakest spot, and he goes right for it. That's where he goes. All right? So, there are three things we need to understand. And I'll put them on the board, and that'll be our outline. Ah, I've already messed up. I thought I had it wrong. The warrior's enemy. We need to understand him. And the Bible says we're not ignorant about him. We do understand him if, if we listen to what uh, God has said about him. Number two, the warrior's equipment. And that's beautifully pictured in 6, 13 to 17. The warrior's energy. Where does his power come from? And that's pictured in 6, 18 to 20. All right, so that will be what we'll talk about. So let's talk first about the warrior's enemy. We are told explicitly what he's like. Now, the intelligence core in every battle is constantly accumulating knowledge about the enemy. One of the, one of the important things to winning a battle is to know what they're up to. And so you have tremendous intelligent, intelligence uh, organizations that know how to ferret out those, those secrets and, and, and spy on the enemy. That's very important, to know the enemy. And God has given us all the important facts we need to know about this enemy. So we are not ignorant of his devices because God has clearly told us what he's up to. Number one, he is a formidable foe. He's an accuser of the brethren. It says he stands before God and accuses us day and night. We see it with Job. Just constantly. And if we didn't have an intercessor there, we'd be licked. But he is there constantly accusing. He is constantly trying to bring some charge against us, trying to somehow lessen the resources that we get. So I don't know what all he's trying to accomplish, but he's there accusing us before God day and night, the Bible says. He's an adversary that uses murder and lies. I have references for all of these. Let me give you a couple of them. He says God is not good. That's what he told Eve. God isn't good. He's withholding things from you that you could benefit from. In fact, he's just really a, a miserly God. Another thing we find out, he can take the form of a lion. He can take the form of a serpent. He can take a form, the form of an angel of light. He can take the form of a God of this world. And not only that, he has helpers. He... <laughs> As if, he, as if he didn't have enough up his sleeve. He has helpers. It says we are, a, uh, uh, this is what's against us. The helpers that the devil is using. Despotisms, powers, master spirit. Uh, well, let me read it in the Amplified. This, actually, I'm reading verse 12 in the Amplified. We wrestle against the despotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly sphere. So you have these organized uh, entities here on earth that are dominated, the nations dominated by the devil. And then you have the, in the heavenly sphere, you have that against us uh, in the heavenly sphere. Okay. So, so there, there you have it. It's not, it's, uh, uh, he has helpers. 
The second thing we notice is he controls the affairs of the nations. We'll find in Daniel that the king of Persia, uh, the prince of the king of Persia, withstood the heavenly help that was coming to Daniel. So here's this nation, and there's a prince. It's an adversarial prince that was able to actually, believe it or not, stop the angel that was coming to help Daniel. That's awesome that the devil has that kind of power. He controls the affairs of nations. The next thing we learn about him, he's not only strong, but he's very subtle. He's very crafty. He knows if he came out with a blatant lie, we wouldn't believe him. So he does little things like this. He pits faith against works and creates a controversy that creates confusion in churches for centuries and leads many people astray, including Mennonites. He separates justification and sanctification. Well, sanctification is simply the fulfillment of justification, but he somehow separates those two and gives sort of the idea you can be justified without being sanctified. Those are two separate things. He leads people to borrow from, I'm going to use the word Protestant, methods and lingo and logic. That happened in the last century, where we borrowed wholesale for the Sunday school and the revivals and all those things that were happening. We borrowed, whole, and, and the fight against fundamental, uh, modernism, we borrowed wholesale from the Protestants and basically brought in a huge Protestant influence and, and changed our whole thinking from a save me gospel that focuses on getting saved so you can go to heaven instead of getting, uh, <laughs> bringing heaven to earth by surrendering to the king. That was a huge victory. It's all about getting to heaven. What's in between? Well, you know, then there's a lot of controversy about all that. Lose the vision of this is to be an ideal society, actually living out the high ideals for marriage, for relationships on all levels, honesty, all of those things. This is to be a picture of heaven on earth. That was sort of taken away from us. But it, we needed to fight modernism, Edsel. Yeah, so we do. But this is how we do it. And we end up with what we got. He confuses excitement with, move, with the movement of the Holy Spirit. Just talked to someone the other day. They were on their way to a Christian concert. And, uh, oh, my, you ought to come to our concert. And I said, well, what, what is it? <laughs> it was drums and, and rocky music and so on. But see, people participate in that, and they feel like they've really had a great worship experience. They ex confuse excitement with the movement of the Holy Spirit. My Bible tells me that actually the Holy Spirit moves with a still, small voice to people who will listen. It leads people to condone self-expression and individualism as evidences of vital spirituality. It champions variety rather than oneness of faith and practice. It convinces people that worldly fashion is just a matter of taste. It's not really worldly. I know the world's doing it, but it's just a matter of taste. And that's just a small list. I could make a huge list if I take time to think about it. The little things that come into people's thinking and practice that basically is the small wedge that finally leads to the way it goes. I, I wish you could all read that wonderful church of the history, history of the Church of the Brethren that Brother Edsel learned to me. It's amazing. Here was a plain congregation, and he details in great specifics how they, the road that they went. And it's the road that the, everybody takes that, goes, that ends up there. <laughs> I mean, it's the road Chambersburg took. It's the road that other churches that I've visited took. We are not to be ignorant, and, and the brethren in Christ, if Brother Brandon was here, he could confirm what I just said. We are not to be ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians 2.11. But he does masquerade as an angel of light, and usually in the form of Christianity, backed up with convincing arguments and scriptural theology. He blinds men to the truth. And many mighty men have fallen. Abraham, Moses, and David were tricked into sin by this, this devil. And so Paul is saying, use all your armor and stand your ground. 
don't budge an inch away from the truth that you have been taught. So, what is the warrior's equipment? Well, 614 talks about a girdle of truth. Truth is integrity, which has the idea of integrating. It holds everything together. A person who's absolutely uh, scrupulous with his integrity, you see his life integrate. You don't see loose ends. You don't see things leading off. Everything comes together. And you see it in his family and his influence, and you, you just see it, that, that things, come to, things come together. The opposite, of course, is uh, <clears throat> falsehood, which fragments. You see fragmentation where you see falsehood. Things do not add up the way they're supposed to. And so he says, be sure that you are absolutely honest with your thinking. Be sure you're absolutely honest with your response to Jesus. Be sure you're absolutely honest with, with what you know God wants you to do. And don't start rationalizing and don't start messing around with it and saying what I said in Sunday school. Yes, God said this or Jesus said this, but we have to read between the lines. What he's saying is eagerly and tenaciously grasp every truth from God and experience and hold on to it and don't let go. I see so many people that stood for something at one time what happened? It happens. So, the girdle of truth, an absolute integrity and honesty with what we know God has said. Because once you start rationalizing, it just gets more and more and more rationalized until you see what you see. The second thing he says in verse 14 is put on the breastplate of righteousness. Right living protects the heart from wrong desires. The heart is the seat of desire. And it's like my dad always said, you make your decisions and then your decisions make you. you th what you think, you finally become. Our thinking and our actions form our desires. So compromise in some aspect of your life and you will soon be thinking something that corresponds with that. And so he says, right living... Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Protect your desires by the way you live, by the way you think, by the way you act, by the way you decide. Because once you just start deciding wrong and once you start thinking wrong and once you start rationalizing, your desires will go that direction. That's what he's saying. E. Stanley Jones said it this way, and I remember I put this on the wall of the, my classroom out at Anchor one time, and Starla had a real problem with this, but I still think it's true. It's easier to act your way into right thinking than to think your way into right acting. That's, I'm not saying you can't think your way into right acting, but it's actually sort of easier. And I kind of think that was what we as young people growing up experienced. There were things our parents required of us, and we did them, and we did them, and eh, you know. And as we got older, as we were doing them, all of a sudden, you know, I now understand. That ever happened to you, Brother Harvey? Right living is very important. Once you start compromising in your lifestyle, the thin edge is there. The thin edge is there. The desires will begin to go that direction. 615, put on the gospel of peace. Now you can't stand, this is a call to stand, you can't stand if your feet are wounded. So what is the protection for the feet? It's peace. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Christians are not people who fight against other people. They fight against wrong. They might have to point out the wrong in somebody's life, but they do it in a peaceful way. It can't be said that they did it with fighting words or fighting actions. And that truth might hurt. It might hurt, but it won't hurt because of the way it was done. We are to be people with the gospel of peace. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And the peace of God gives us a clear way to walk. Did you ever notice uh, that wonderful verse, and I've given it here before, but I'll remind you of it in 1 John 2, verses 10 to 11. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. See, he walks without stumbling because he loves his brother. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness, that bad attitude toward his brother, has blinded his eyes. So the gospel of peace is very important 
for our feet if we want to walk right and have a healthy uh, stance. You know, Napoleon even noticed that at the end of his life, after he'd been exiled and had time to think about his life, he said this. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I founded empires, but on what did we rest the creations of our genius? On force. Jesus Christ alone founded his empire upon love, and at this hour, millions of people would die for him. And then he says, above all, take the shield of faith. Above all, take the shield of faith. Trust in God no matter what. That's what faith is. Forsaking all, I trust him. Learn to see and avoid clever rationalizations. And rationalization is a powerful thing. I mean, looking back over my life, remembering what people said about things that were obviously not right, but they had convinced themselves they were. When down deep inside, if they had been absolutely honest, they just said, this is what God says. And no, I can't, I, I can't go down that road. Trust what God has said explicitly. That's the shield of faith. Learn to see and avoid clever rationalization. Clever rationalization is what Dean Taylor calls salvation by theology. Instead of going to what Jesus said, you go to the epistles. And then you manipulate them all around and arrange them in an order that says you can do this, but it contradicts what Jesus actually said. What did Jesus actually say about spiritual security? He that endures to the end shall be saved. What did Jesus actually say about the evidence of the Holy Spirit? He said it would guide you into all truth. He didn't say that you jump up and down and clap your hands and shout hallelujah if you were filled with the Spirit. He said it would lead you into all truth. What did he say about wealth? He said it is wrong to accumulate wealth for yourself. He said that. He said lay up treasures in heaven, and then basically what he said was, Disperse with as much of it as you possibly can and lay as much treasure up in heaven as you possibly can and live on the barest minimum and be content. That's, what, that's, what, that's the gospel on that subject. Probably hasn't been anything more compromised in our circles than that one. And probably the reason why people went down the road they went. One of the big reasons why. Learn to interpret the epistles through the Gospels. I think the primary focus should be on what did Jesus actually say. Now we go to the epistles and how does that explain what Jesus said, not rationalize it. <clears throat> the, second, the next thing he points out is the helmet of salvation. Protects the head, the mind. The mind is the key. All through the epistles especially, there's the call to get knowledge and to get understanding. Now, that's not talking about going to Shippensburg and amassing facts. It's talking about getting knowledge, true knowledge, having a true uh, body of facts and information and understanding those facts. In fact, after Ephesians chapter 1, that's what Paul's praying. The last whole half of the chapter is just praying that they would have the knowledge to know how much power God has given us and the fact that he resides in his body. We are transformed by the renewing of the mind. Romans 6.11 says, Reckon ye yourselves to be dead unto sin. That's something that you have, to, you have to be thinking. So you're tempted to sin, and you say, oh my. But reckon the fact that there's nothing in there that's going to make you do that. You can actually choose to do something else, and then all of heaven will open up and support you. But you have to know that. Because you're tempted to believe this is what you should do. And this looks, quite, I don't know about that. But that's what God said. So you reckon yourself that your flesh doesn't have to do that. It can't make you do that. The world can't make you do that. The devil can't make you do that. You can actually choose. And then all of heaven will be there. Because God's eyes run to and fro throughout the whole world. And he's looking for people whose hearts are perfect toward him. And immediately when they begin to move, he begins to move. Now, he's not going to support you if you decide to do something he doesn't want you to do. <laughs> You're not going to get any heavenly support for that. 
So it's all about the mind. It's all about understanding, thinking right about the decisions you're making. All right? If you act in obedience, I wrote it down. All of heaven is behind you. Ephesians 1.3. He's opened us all the resources in the heavenly spheres. And finally, on this list of equipment, the sword of the spirit, which is the only offensive weapon, which is the word of God. That means precise statements in scripture that gives you clear and objective direction. The word here is the word rhema, which means precise statements of scripture. And it says that, that the, the scripture will pierce the hearts of those in Satan's kingdom. And I think about this often when I'm talking to people in the billboard line. I need to give scripture. The promise is with that scripture that after they leave this conversation, it has the ability, not my words, but the words of God himself has the ability to pierce to, uh, this is an offensive weapon. It will pierce and destroy the works of the devil. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And we should have our minds filled with it. You know, before the printing press, they had to. People in other parts of the world, they don't have Bibles. They can't just go get a concordance and look up verses. Uh-uh. They have to have those in their memory. And that's what we should be doing. We should have the Word of God in our memory. When somebody brings up something, we should be able to actually think a scriptural verse about that. As much as possible. We'll never do it perfectly, and it's a lifetime project. But that should be a goal, that that word, that rhema, that precise statement that matches that situation is just right there. Fill the memory with God's supernatural words. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And like I said, the Waldensians, when I read how they memorized huge portions of scripture and had it at their fingertips, and the Anabaptists were that way too, but uh, it's amazing, but we've become lazy. We have this. And then we have the electronic technology, which some people think makes it even easier. And so now somehow we need all of, no, 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 no. What we need is to get this in our minds and in our hearts so that we don't have to go here all the time and certainly don't have to go to electronic media to get it with all its distractions and all the other roads it brings up while we're trying to find something about the Bible. <clears throat> and finally, the warrior's energy. That was the warrior's equipment. Well, I haven't been reading this. Let's start reading here in verse 10, and we'll read this last part. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole army of, armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, Wherefore, take unto you the whole, see it's emphasizing the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. There's no room for complacency here. There's no room for carelessness. There's no room for any of that that we see so much of around us. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, integrity that will bring all things together and integrate. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, right living that will protect your desires. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, know that word of God to be able to just shoot it right out there in every situation. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, watch your thinking. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And now here's the energy. Notice the emphasis here. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching thereto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me. And that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in bonds. That therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Prayer is the energy. And we can have all the armor. And we can understand everything about it. But there has to be energy. There has to be supernatural energy. 
Prayer is the energy that enables the Christian to wear the armor and wield the sword. When Amalek attacked Israel, Moses interceded on the mountain while Joshua fought the battle in the valley with the weapons. He talks about all prayer. There's more than one kind of prayer. There's supplication. That's entreaty. That's Jacob saying, I won't let you go until you bless me. That's supplication. Or the Syrophoenician woman that says, I know you said you won't give bread to dogs, but can't the dogs eat the crumbs under the table? She wouldn't let him go. <clears throat> or it's George Mueller, as I told you in the past, who prayed for 50 years for five friends and just wouldn't quit. Just prayed 50 years for five friends. That's supplication. Intercession. Intercession is when you pray for somebody else. They may be in no position to pray. They may be lost people, but they need someone to intercede on their behalf with God. A, 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 a daysman, somebody between, not a priest, we're not talking about that, but someone who by prayer connects God with their situation. That's intercession. And it says we should be doing that for all saints. Okay? And then he ends here, and uh, I hope I can be brief, with some specific observations and admonitions. He says we should pray in the spirit, not fleshly promptings. I get all kinds of calls. Would you please pray for me <clears throat> uh, that I would win this basketball game? I'm going to this concert tonight. Would you pray for me that uh, God will be glorified and it's a rock concert? Uh, all kinds of things people pray. Be sure you're praying in the spirit. Be sure you're praying in the spirit. Not getting man's will done in heaven, but getting God's will done on earth. The Spirit is very much involved in our prayers, according to Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. It says the Spirit even takes after we've prayed the best we can and interprets those prayers to God so that it gets to Him according to His will. And if He hears it according to His will, then we have the petition. So the Spirit is very much involved in our prayers, but He's not going to be involved if we're not praying in the Spirit, if we're not praying in harmony with what, we, with what the Holy Spirit would want. Watching thereunto. Keep alert. Don't be caught unprepared like the disciples when they brought the demon-possessed boy. They weren't ready for that. Watch and pray is found four times in the scripture. So we need to be vigilant. We started out with vigilance. <clears throat> we need to be vigilant. Constantly saying, I need to bring this to pr in prayer. I'm not ready for this. I, I need to pray. I need to ask God. I need help. I need those resources. We need to be, that, that should be our frame of mind in all of life. And then 618 says perseverance. Don't quit. It's the persistent prayer that gets answered. Not the prayer that you prayed tomorrow and then you never pray for it again. Now God is merciful and if he sees the needs great enough, he will hear that desperate cry, I'm sure. But basically, the basic concept of prayer is it's the prayer that's prayed over and over like the George Mueller prayer. And we have two parables where Jesus told about that. That it's persistence that gets the answer. The widow and the unjust judge. Pray without ceasing. They did that for Peter. Acts 12, 5, it says prayer was made without ceasing for Peter. And they got the answer. And then it says we're to pray with all saints. <clears throat> I'm sorry, for all saints. It's a corporate focus our Father, which art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. It's all, they're all plural pronouns, okay? So we're to pray for all saints. We win together. I don't know how many people I talk to who are in trouble, and they call themselves Christians, and I, I say, are you part of a church? Nah. Philippians chapter 1, Paul talks about the fellowship of the saints as being his guarantee that they're going to finish successfully because they're united. He says, you are partakers of my grace. I'm contributing to your, your success. You're contributing to my success. The Bible clearly teaches that. It clearly teaches that. So to be disconnected from the body of Christ is to make yourself vulnerable. I heard the story, maybe you've heard me tell it, uh, an African missionary one time in a children's meeting told a story of, uh, in Africa, she saw some cattle in a meadow and uh, in the trees around the meadow, she saw a lion that was stalking and he wanted one of those cattle. But he knew that if he, if he tried to attack the herd, they would stampede him to death. So he managed to distract one of them, and then guess what happened? He had then what he wanted. 
And I really think that's true. I think a lot of people, they may even be members of a church, but they're disconnected. They don't hear the counsel. They don't participate. They don't get involved. They don't integrate. They don't really connect in real fellowship. They're vulnerable. They're very vulnerable and very likely won't make it. It's a corporate purpose, uh, focus that we need to have. Christ wanted his disciples to pray with him. He wanted this. He, of course, had to do without it, but he want, that's what Jesus wanted. Paul wants an intercessory prayer here. He wants these people to all be praying for him, for his success as a missionary. And then there's something not listed here that I thought I should also list, and that is it, usually when it talks about prayer, it talks about prayer with thanksgiving. And we have that in Philippians 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known, be made for all men. William Law says this in his book, A, a, a Serious Call to Devout and Holy Life. Would you know who is the greatest saint in the world? It's not he that pra prays the most. It's not he that fasts the most. It's not he who gives the most. It is not the person who's more em eminent in his temperance or chastity or justice. But it is he who is always thankful to God, who wills everything that God wills, who receives everything as an instance of God's goodness and has a heart always ready to praise God for it. So if thankfulness is not added to the prayer, it has no strength. Thankfulness realizes everything comes from God and constantly lives in that perspective and responds accordingly with a thankful heart. So here we are. We know our enemy. He's a powerful enemy. He has uh, helpers, powerful helpers, nations, principalities in the heavens. And he's, he's very wily. He knows how to put the thin edge in. And that thin edge always sounds right because it is rationalized with scripture and it sounds this has to be a right way. And all that he can do. But we have equipment. And I described it to you this morning. Protect our hearts by doing honestly what we know is right. Protect our thinking. Guard against rationalization. Don't let, it ha don't, don't let yourself do it. Do exactly what Jesus says. And all that that I told you. And then prayer, if it's not part of that, this will all fail. Or this part will fail.